Hi, welcome to the shop. We're going to take a look at the Model 28 KSR, a little bit of a break from the work on the transmitter distributor. I don't know how common this is, but my Model 28 KSR has a Here Is button on the keyboard and a corresponding mechanism that will look like look at in the keyboard mechanism behind. My understanding is that these Here Is buttons were present on TWX KSRs, which was a, an American service that was an analog to the European Telex service. When you, in the U.S., wanted to send someone a telegram in the teletype telegram days, you might use the Telex service. So when you push this Here Is button, it causes the teletype to spool out a sequence of characters that are encoded on a rotating drum. And we're going to look at that drum, and we're going to look at the encoding on that drum, and I'm going to see if I can't draw some encoding plates for the drum so that I can encode my own message to be spooled out when the Here Is button is pressed. So first off, let's turn on the teletype. I've got the cover open, and we'll take a look at what the Here Is button does when it's pressed. Now, the teletype is a little bit loud, so I apologize for that in advance. I've tried to get all of this in the shot so that you can see both the button press and the spooling out of the characters at the same time. Now, you probably won't be able to see the detail unless you're on an HD view, but hopefully you can get one of those. So again, here's the Here Is button, and when we press this, it's going to cause the teletype to do some automatic typing. As you can see on my teletype, it causes it to type the, the letters GTM space and then an abbreviated Cedarville. Now due to the provenance of my teletype, I believe this is Cedarville in Southwest Ohio and that this teletype was used in a, a TWX office in Cedarville, Ohio, but I don't know that for sure. At any rate, for amateur service, I have very little use for a teletype that spins out the words GTM Cedarville, so I would like to see if I can encode my call sign or a little bit of similar data on the Here Is wheel. So let's take a look at the Here Is wheel and how the text is encoded to be spooled out when the button is pressed. So here's the same thing from a different point of view. This is the here is mechanism in here. Really just this wheel and some apparatus here. This is the normal keyboard signaling mechanism over here that is used by the here is wheel when it sends out a message. So when I press this here is button, what you're gonna see is this wheel is going to ratchet one stop at a time to these little plates with tines on them that you can see on the wheel. And at each stop, it's going to send the Baudot encoded character that is represented by the plate with tines. And I don't know if it was visible, but there is a special plate that went by that has the encoding that tells it that the message is over. You can just see it down here in the bottom here, this plate here that looks like a solid bar across the mechanism. That's the stop plate that tells it that the mechanism has sent its entire message. So when we press the Here Is button, it electrically releases this mechanism and causes it to run one revolution until it hits this stop plate right here. And each of these plates has six tines on it, some of which may be broken off. So here's an unencoded plate with six tines on it. And here's an encoded plate with two of those six tines broken off right here in the middle. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this wheel out, we're going to take some of these plates out of here and see if we can get measurements to have some plates cut that have all six tines on them so that they can be modified to spool out any message that we want to send. Now I've turned off the teletype so that we can hear a little bit better. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take out this mechanism. And the first thing we're going to do to do that is we're going to take off this little piece of sheet metal on the front that goes between the keyboard and the latching teletype cover and forms part of the audio baffle for the teletype when it's normally operating. And to do that, there are a couple of thumb wheels on the back here that we spin open. And then this piece just slides to one side and lifts out. We have to do a little bit carefully so we don't mess up the paint. I 
looks like I didn't open that quite far enough and lifts right out of there. So now we can get a little bit better look at this mechanism and how it's put in here. So this is the here is mechanism with its encoding plates and the wheel. And if you can see here, it has an axle that fits into a J channel and clips down underneath this little piece right here. And it's the same on the back. So to remove this mechanism, we push it down and to the right hand side of the teletype and it will lift out. But before we do that, we have to disconnect this mechanism right here that's attached to the plate so that we can get it out as well. In order to do that, we're just going to lift this spring off of this little pin right here. And this spring is hooked around a little piece of sheet metal down here that you can't see. And I'm going to leave it lay in place right there, and it'll stay right there. So now that we've done that, this piece right here that's on the end of the wheel rotates and is free with the wheel. So we just take the wheel, and we push it a little bit to the right, and rotate it up, and it lifts right out of the teletype, and we can look at its pieces. So here's the encoding wheel as it came out of the teletype, and it has this mechanism on the end that is part of the ratchet that keeps it going only in, in one direction. You can see the little paw there. And we're going to need to take that off in order to get it apart. So in order to take that part off, it's pretty easy. It rides on this shaft that runs through the middle of the wheel and out this side, but there's no retainer once it's out of the machine. It's held in between those two little clips that were in the teletype itself. So we just take it and we pull it off one end. We're going to lift the pawl up and over the O-ring and right out of the way. So now we're left with this, which as I said, has an O-ring on each end, and the O-rings are what holds these plates in place. And as I said, here's the stop bar right here that tells the teletype that the message is over. And here are the encoding plates. And you can see they have these six tines in here with some gaps in between. The stop sensor, I believe, rides right here on this bar, whereas you can see there's a gap on every other plate in the, machine, in the encoding wheel. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll these O-rings gently off the end. Now these O-rings are 60 years old, but they seem to be in pretty good shape. We're going to be careful with them so that we don't uh, do any additional damage with them, but I, I, to them, but I think we're going to be able to reuse them. So I took both O-rings off of this, and what I found was that the, co the code plates are free enough in here that they were literally just falling out of the unit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and leave the code plates or the O-ring on one end to keep the code plates in place. But we'll take this stop bar out of here and take a look at it. So here's the stop plate. And that's not the teletype term for this. That's just what I'm calling it for the time being. And as you can see, it has two ears, one on each end, that slide in under those O-rings and allow it to be held into the mechanism. And it has a tooth here that keeps it from being put backwards into the code wheel. If we look at the code wheel where it was removed, there's a groove right here that this tooth falls into. So if I put it in like this, that tooth falls into the groove, and if I put it in like this, it cannot be inserted all the way because it will strike the drum. And so even though I already have one of these code plates, I'm going to go ahead and take measurements off of this and see if I can have another one made. And the reason for that is that my call sign requires eight ready characters, uh, which my call sign is KB8OJH, and those characters would be KB figures eight letters OJH, which I believe can be placed on this wheel twice. So press, pressing the here is button would cause it to spool out my call sign, which obviously is an amateur radio operator I will use quite a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and have one of these code plates made because I believe I can put two of them on the wheel and thus spool only a half wheel at a time. And here we have a character code plate. And you can see that it's made in approximately the same way as the stop bar, except that it has specific tines on it. It still has these ears on the end that are held by the O-rings. It still has this tooth that prevents it from being put in backwards. But then instead of having a solid bar across, it has a series of cutout tines. And if you look at these tines, you can see that there's a little groove machined at the base of each one. And the way that you encode these code plates is by snapping off those tines to produce the Baudo characters that you wish to send. And so what we're going to do with this is take a measurement of this plate, including all of the tines, and see if we can get these manufactured so that we can put a, an encoding of our choosing on the wheel. So I've cleaned up this plate, 
and what we're going to do first is we're going to try to measure the thickness of this plate and figure out what gauge it is so we can have it made out of material of the appropriate type. So if we put it in the micrometer here, spin it down till the ratchet runs. Okay, so we're looking at 25, 30, about 33 thousandths. And I don't have to get too fussy about that, I don't think, because I don't think that's a real critical dimension. But if you look it up in tables, and I've already done so, 33 thousandths is about 21 gauge steel. So we'll see if we can't get some of these made out of 21 gauge steel. And I'm going to double check one of these, but I believe they're made out of the same material. Now the next thing we'll do is we'll use a set of dial calipers to get some of the other features on this. So the tooth width that's held in by the O-ring is probably supposed to be 40 thousandths, but we have about 41 thousandths there. Let's double check the other end to make sure they're the same. That one's a little bit larger. 42 thousandths. So maybe 41, 42 thousandths. Again, I don't think this is particularly critical. And this isn't super precise, but it's going to be good enough for what we need to do here. Hard to do with the camera in front of me. And that's about, say, a hundred and ten thousandths. So you also see that there are some relief cuts here. And I imagine that those are just there so that this sits flat and square when it's placed in. And there's no opportunity for burrs either in these corners or in the corner of that groove. Although it appears to be machined quite nicely to prevent this from seating flat. So I'm not going to take measurements on that. We'll just put a little bit of a relief in the part that we draw. So we can go draw up one of these. Now I'm going to take similar measurements off of this code plate here, but uh, since this is a little awkward with the camera between me and the code plate, and because uh, this one I think is going to require a little bit more precision, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that off camera. I, I should note that another way we could take these measurements that's fairly accurate, and we may do this to compare, is to place this on a flatbed scanner with a high contrast material behind it and scan it. Now a modern flatbed scanner, the one I have, will scan at up to, um, I, I'm not sure, I think 1600 dpi, uh, which is well under a thousandth of, the, of an inch. And, and I don't think that the um, detail that's required for this is required down to that sort of level. I think, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 thousandths for most of these features is, is plenty. Now, I don't know that, and I didn't get that from a design manual, um, but uh, I think that uh, looking at how it works, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be plenty close with me sort of just eyeballing the, the back side of this or, or scanning it on a scanner and taking the measurements from that. Because while the scanner's resolution limits your measurement capability, within the resolution that it has, it's, it's pretty precise. So we may take a look at that later. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to take some measurements off of this. So uh, I've taken the measurements here, and uh, I've got some, some numbers that I'm pretty happy with. And one of the things that I did to arrive at that was I took some measurements of the gaps on some pieces that had missing teeth so that I could actually get my calipers in there, you know, and, and take some measurements. And then I'd add up the stack up and make sure that it coincided with what I've measured. And I've got some numbers I'm pretty happy with. Uh, looking at these numbers, I actually think that this may likely have been designed in metric, uh, which would have been a little unusual for the early 50s in the United States, except that this was done by, uh, on, I believe, military contract. So this may actually be a metric part. 
But again, I don't think our tolerances are so critical that we won't be okay using these uh, thousandth, of, thousandth of an inch sort of resolution measurements uh, that I've taken here. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take one of these and we're going to go ahead and put it in CAD. I was a little bit glib before uh, about the uh, precision that I was getting measuring this without actually having a reference for the ends. So I wound up putting it in a machinist vise so I could measure between these surfaces and the ends uh, with a little bit more precision. And I say I was glib not because I think that the absolute precision actually matters, and we'll look at that at the mechanism and how it reads these here in a little bit, and, and you'll see why. I think, you know, tens of thousands is, is absolutely fine, but more because the scientist in me just uh, couldn't stand it. So uh, I've got a good measurement, I think, a set of good measurements off of one of these, and I've drawn it in a CAD program, and let's take a look at that. So here we are. Uh, we have the part drawn up in uh, CAD. And this is within just a few mil in each dimension of the actual parts. Now the actual parts as I measure them are not all identical. They also differ by a few mil. They're just stamped sheet metal. So uh, I guess depending on how worn the dies were or possibly which die they were stamped out of, they're, they're just a little bit different. Um, but the dimensions, the critical dimensions, I think, are, are correct. I have from this tine, the end of this tine, to uh, the end of this group. And from the, so the width of this group, I can measure these dimensions quite accurately. Uh, I can get my gauges in there and measure them. And um, those are all within one mil or so, same on this side. So, you know, within one mil is plenty enough. Again, we'll look at the actual wheel, how it mounts, and the mechanism that it actuates, and you'll see why uh, I'm not super concerned if we're just a little bit off. Um, and then the end at end, we're, we're, it's not quite as close. It's within about five mil. But as I said, the, the parts differ by several mil from, from end to end. So, you know, five thousandths of an inch in, in this part is, is just not a big deal. Uh, the underside features I think I've captured very accurately, which I think is probably um, maybe a little more important because this key has to fit in the keyway in the appropriate position in, with respect to these tines. So I, I think that we have done that. I looked up the name of these parts in the teletype documentation and they call this a code blade. And the part that uh, I was calling the, the I think the uh, code stop bar, they actually call the code stop blade or the stop code blade. Um, so, uh, that's, I guess, what, what we should call them as blades. Um, the, the dimensions of that code stop blade um, are, as we discussed before, they're the same down here as the code blades in, in the bottom part, and then it's just squared off on the top. So that's a simple enough modification. We'll do that modification in the CAD and uh, have some of those uh, fabricated as well. Here's the code wheel back in position so that we can take a look at what I believe are the critical dimensions. So if you see in here these little hooks, these hooks are what read the actual Bado code off of the, the plates as they rotate past. And they read it off of the plate that is presently horizontal and facing the right side of the machine. And so these hooks are... Um, you know, I don't know, 60 mil, 50 mil wide. Um, and they just have to catch on the, the plate as it goes by and either be pushed out by the plate or allowed to, to fall in uh, on the plate. So if you see, watch this hook as it rotates by, it's going to go from where it is pushed out by this tine here to where it falls in uh, where there's no tine on the next plate. And that's how we encode uh, a bit with, with this wheel. So just so long as these tabs on the code blades uh, can activate these hooks, then there's plenty of precision there uh, for them to, to do their job. So, you know, a few mil in one direction or the other is just not going to make a big difference. So the other plate that we should look at is the, the stop plate right here. And it activates this little hook here that has an extra little tail, uh, unlike these, these hooks that decode the Baudot bits. 
And we, we can't tell without turning the machine on because this plate, this hook only falls in when the here is uh, on the keyboard is activated. So I'm going to flip on the machine. Again, it'll be a little noisy. And we'll watch how that operates to trigger the stop hook. So notice that there's, there's, that the stop plate has uh, material here, whereas none of the other plates around the, the wheel have material in that position. So here it goes. Now if we watch this rotate around, when I push the here is button, you'll see this hook will fall, and then when the plate, the stop plate rotates around again, it will push this hook back out, stopping the encoding. There we go. And so again, the stop plate, we just have to make sure that we've got material in this space. In fact, some of the documentation, let me turn this off. Some of the teletype documentation seems to indicate that perhaps there were stop plates that had tines on them uh, to encode letters. Um, and I guess later, maybe as a cost saving, it, it became this solid bar because the stop plate always encodes a letter's character. Um, and the reason for that is that it is as long as the tines on every space on this code plate, uh, and that is the, the same encoding as the letter's Baudo shift character. So that's my project for the weekend. I've taken some measurements and I'm going to see if I can get some of those code plates manufactured so that when I press my here is button, it will state who is actually at this console and spin out my call sign. I'll follow up with this uh, hopefully in a few weeks after I've had a chance to get some of those cut and let you know how it went.